Hello and welcome to this video in which we will determine whether or not the discrete system defined by y of n is equal to x of n times x of n plus 1 is memoryless, time invariant, linear, causal, and stable. So let's begin with memoryless. In order to be memoryless, a system's output at time n has to depend only on its input at time n. And we can see from the equation that defines this system that the output at time n depends on the input at time n and as well as the input at time n plus 1. So this is not a memoryless system. So let's see if the system is time invariant. Okay, in order to be time invariant, the system has to um, satisfy the following. I take an input signal, I run it through the system and delay it, or I take that same input signal, delay it, run the delayed version through the system, and in both of those cases I should get the same thing. So let's see what happens if I do that for this system. Okay, if I have some arbitrary x1 of n going through my system, the y1 of n is going to be x1 of n times x1 of n plus 1. Okay. And now to find uh, z1 of n, I get uh, z1 of n by taking y1 and replacing its argument, in this case n, by n minus cap n. So in this case I'll replace this n and this n by n minus cap n. So in this case we would have z1 of n is equal to x1 and I replace n by n minus cap n times x1 of n and again I replace this by n minus cap n plus 1. Okay so this is the output along this top configuration. Along the bottom configuration, um, I have the delay first, so the input to the system is x2 of n, uh, which is x1 of n minus cap n, and then the output is going to be, um, well, here, let's actually write it out. The output z2 of n is going to be x2 of n times x2 of n plus 1. Now x2 of n is equal to x1 of n minus cap n. Okay, so this guy is x1 of n minus cap n. This guy here is going to be x2 of n, or its argument, in this case n plus 1 minus cap n. Okay. So I have z1 is x1 of n minus cap n times x1 of n minus cap n plus 1. Uh, I have z2 is x1 of n minus cap n times x, that should have been an x1, I'm sorry, x1 of n plus 1 minus cap n. So you can see that uh, these two are indeed the same. So I can say then that my system is actually time invariant. Okay, next thing to check is linearity. And to be linear, a system has to satisfy both homogeneity and additivity. So this first uh, screen shows how to test for homogeneity. And the idea is I take my signal, I run it through the system, and then I multiply by A, the output by A. Then I take my signal, I multiply it by A, run it through the system. And if these two things are the same, then I can say that my system satisfies homogeneity. Okay, so if I take x as the input and y as the output, then y is going to be x of n times x of n plus 1, and then I'll multiply that by a to get that this is a x of n x of n plus 1. Okay, so now um, in the second configuration I'm actually going to multiply the input by a. So the output here is going to be 
a times x of n, because that's what the input is, times a x of n plus 1. Because again, uh, my system basically takes its input at time n, multiplies it by the input at time n plus 1. <clears throat> so you can see, and I can collect these a's out in front as a squared x of n, x of n plus 1. So you can see that this system does not satisfy homogeneity because if I multiply by a before running through the system, I get an a squared term. If I multiply after running through the system, I get just an a term. So I can say then that the system, because it doesn't satisfy homogeneity, is not linear. Now just to make sure it's clear how we would uh, how we work these things to check for additivity, we'll actually check for additivity as well and see what we get. Uh, those of you that don't want to check for additivity, if you just wanted to know the answer, uh, fast forward the video for a bit. Okay, so to check for additivity, my upper configuration, I take x1, run it through the system and get y1, and y1 is going to be x1 of n times x1 of n minus 1. y2 is going to be x2 of n times x2 of n minus 1. So the sum of these two guys is just going to be x1 of n times x1 of, whoops, how'd that change to a minus? That should be plus, n plus 1 plus x2 of n, x2 of n plus 1. Okay, now on the bottom, on this bottom configuration, we will send x1 of n plus x2 of n through. And so the output here is going to be x1 of n plus x2 of n, this multiplied by x1 of n plus 1 plus x2 of n plus 1. Okay, and so when I, I, I can actually start multiplying this out and I get x1 of n, x1 of n plus 1. That's a good sign. This term here is the same as this term here. And then I'll get, um, well, let's multiply the x2 of n times x2 of n plus 1. So this term here is the same as this term here. But now I'm going to get some other terms that aren't the same. So I'll have x1 of n x2 of n plus 1. This term here does not show up anywhere up here. And finally, I'll have x2 of n times x1 of n plus 1. So these two terms here don't show up anywhere up here. So the system does not satisfy additivity. So this system is nonlinear and it's nonlinear yeah, it's nonlinear because it satisfies neither homogeneity nor additivity. So we'll say, no, it is not linear. Okay, for this system to be causal, um, basically the output at time n needs to depend on the input at time n and the input at previous times. But you can see that the output at time n depends on the input and the input at the next time, at n plus 1. So this is a non-causal system because in order to give you the output at time n, it has to look into the future to time n plus 1. Okay, so we're almost done. The last thing we need to check is stability. So let's suppose that I know that the magnitude of xn for all values of n is less than some constant b. Okay, then um, 
if I want to find the magnitude of xn times, whoops, got ahead of myself there. Let's back up just a tad. xn times xn plus 1. Well, the magnitude of a product is the product of its magnitudes, or the product of the magnitudes. So this is the magnitude of xn times the magnitude of x n plus 1. Now I know that this guy is less than b and this guy is less than b. So I can say then that this magnitude will be less than b squared. I get one b from here and another b from here. So as long as my input is bounded so that for every n its magnitude is less than b, the output will also be bounded and for every n, the output will be less than b squared. So that means that if the input's bounded, the output is bounded, and I can say yes, my system is stable. So that concludes this example. Hopefully you found it both interesting and useful. Thanks for watching.